Welcome everyone to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation. Today we have an author's forum, Paved Paradise, with Henry Grabar. On the Park Bench, a public square conversation is brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in the new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the most pressing issues of the day. So you can sh share your thoughts on hashtag on the park bench. You can go to www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. And you can join us for upcoming On the Park Bench webinars. We have Climate and Equity Challenge projects on Tuesday, July 25th. And that will explore two different projects representing different approaches to centering climate and equity in new urbanism. And you can learn more about that webinar and upcoming webinars at cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench. And don't forget about CNU membership. Thank you to our CNU members for joining us on today's webinar. If you're not yet a CNU member, membership offers the opportunity to join an interdisciplinary network of new urbanist practitioners across sectors, professions, and geography. You can learn more about membership and benefits at members.cnu.org. And now for today's webinar, Henry Grabar is a staff writer at Slate, where he writes the Metropolis column with a focus on housing, transportation, and the environment. His work has been published in Architect, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Harper's, The Wall Street Journal, and other outlets. And he's produced podcasts for Decoder Ring, 99% Invisible, What Next, and other shows. His research on French colonial architecture in Algiers after 1962 was published in the journal Cultural Geographies. Henry was the editor of Future of Transportation Anthology. And most recently, he is the author of Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World, which was published in May, 2023 by Penguin Press. Henry has discussed these subjects on television and radio and before audiences at New America, the National Press Foundation and various conferences and classrooms. He taught journalism to students uh, from the University of Southern California, Sarah Lawrence, and other institutions. His story about immigrants in the meatpacking town of Fremont, Nebraska was a finalist for the 2018 Livingston Award for Excellence in National Reporting by a Journalist Under 35. Henry was the 2020 recipient of the Richard Rogers Fellowship from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Henry graduated from Yale with a degree in American Studies and French. And I'm Lauren Mayer. I am the Communications Manager at CNU. We're going to start today's webinar. So just as a reminder, please use the Q&A function to ask questions as they occur to you, and we will get to them later in the webinar. All right, Henry, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. And it's a pleasure to be here talking about parking with all of you at CNU. I feel like new urbanists were some of the first people in America to really pay attention to parking's um, appetite for urban land and the ways in which it shapes our architecture and our communities. And as I'm sure you are aware, this has um, lately become um, a relatively hot topic in city councils and at community meetings as um, you know, our priorities about climate and our environment and um, the affordability of housing and the types of places we've built, um, those priorities begin to uh, clash with our longstanding um, desire to provide free, convenient, and available parking. I wanted to start with this graph because um, one of the questions I think people often have uh, about parking is like, well, why can't we just make it better? Why can't we just solve this problem? And um, this is, I've heard this thought expressed uh, several times from several different people, um, but it's a classic trilemma, 
which is to say a situation in which you have three goals, but you can only obtain two of them. In this case, the three goals everybody wants for parking are for parking to be free, uh, convenient, which is to say located uh, directly next to the, the thing that you are trying to access, and available, which is to say um, open uh, for you to drive in there and leave your car there at the moment you arrive. Um, unfortunately, because parking both costs a lot of money and takes up a lot of space, and everybody wants to park in the same place at the same time, according to the rhythms of the day, it is impossible to achieve these three objectives um, and, and build anything that, that resembles really um, a living community. Uh, this type of fulfillment of free, convenient, and available is only really possible in a giant suburban strip mall. And even then, in that situation, you would have to ask, how convenient really is this parking for doing anything besides um, walking into uh, the single shop that I that I came here to go to? Um, so I think in this Venn diagram, you see uh, different types of places that fulfill two of these objectives. For example, um, convenient and available but not free uh, corresponds to certain places where there's such a premium on parking that people actually are willing to pay for it, which is to say busy downtowns, um, uh, some small town main streets, uh, airports, stadiums, um, other big destinations. Um, free and convenient uh, would be basically most um, big city American neighborhoods where you drive uh, to the restaurant at night and um, the parking is free and it's right in front of the place you're going, but unfortunately it is not available. Um, and, uh, and that's often because it is free and convenient. There's lots of demand for it. Uh, and then finally, you have parking that is free and available, uh, but not particularly convenient. And that's often where you might end up parking um, when you decide not to pay for parking. Uh, and 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 mostly, though, that, that corresponds to the urban planning paradigm we know as sprawl, where there is lots of parking. It's free. It's always there when you want it, but it's not very convenient. Next. So when I started working on this subject, I delved into a lot of history books and was astounded to find that this problem was just captivated urban leaders in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The question of how to provide enough parking and why it seems so difficult to provide enough parking um, for Americans' demand for driving was just absolutely top of mind for many uh, urban leaders at this time. And this cartoon from the Los Angeles Times, I think, wonderfully illustrates this. The gorilla, if you can see, is is portrayed, um, is it representing the downtown parking problem, sort of uh, towering, hulking over Los Angeles. And um, it just seems hard to believe now, looking back in time, at all the problems that cities confronted at, at, this, at this point in time, that they were so obsessed with um, providing enough parking um, but they were. And, and the results of that, of course, um, are well known next. Because they are codified in the Parking Generation Manual, which is, I'm sure is something that many of you have worked with. But if you haven't, this is the book that tells you how many parking spots should be associated with every single land use. And as you'll see in this slide, it is just wonderfully detailed. I mean, you've got just an astounding variety of um, different types of uh, different types of office buildings, different types of institutional uses, different types of recreational uses from a public park to a marina, golf course. Th there's a small difference between tennis courts and racket and tennis clubs. And all, all this goes to say that uh, this downtown parking crisis of the 1950s produced the sense that these land use codes zoning for parking were absolutely essential and that without them um we would we would wind up with anarchy and and that this was really the only way uh to make sure that we wound up with enough parking um to to suit our societal needs and i just don't think that anybody really could have imagined at the time that these codes would become so ubiquitous and so effective as to create an environment in which that, that so, so little resembled really uh, what had come before, an environment in which parking was 
absolutely plentiful. And then furthermore, they would prohibit the types of buildings um, that had previously characterized the American city to the extent that in many places, um, those types of environments became basically extinct. Um, next. In brief, we wound up with really a lot of parking. Um, here are some images from uh, Atlanta, Los Angeles County on the right, um, Seattle and Philadelphia there on the left. Uh, and just the, the parking is highlighted in all these places. And you can just see that these policies have been tremendously effective. They really have um, accomplished what they set out to do, which was to create enough parking for everybody to have parking that is more or less free, convenient, and available, although there are, you know, chinks in that, uh, that occur in, in various places. And, and there we could say, well, if we haven't managed to create parking that's free, convenient, and available, even when it takes up this much land, how much land really is it going to take? And I think this, this sort of goes to illustrate the fact that um, that goal of uh, adapting suburban parking standards or rather adopting suburban parking standards, bringing them to, to the urban environment um, was always going to be a losing bet because cities were never going to beat suburbs at their own game. If free and easy parking was the most important thing to you, um, the downtown was never going to be the place that, that you wound up shopping and an urban neighborhood was never going to be the place you wanted to live. And a, a small strip of uh, you know adjacent attached restaurants and, and retail was never going to be the place that, that you would want to shop. Um, next. Of course, uh, this abundance, super abundance of parking and required parking also had um, really pronounced effects on the types of structures we are able to build. And this, again, is a subject that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But the more parking you require, um, the more you deform uh, the use of land in favor of um, basically uh, an asphalt block. I, I got um, Alfred Tu, the great California illustrator who did the uh, drawings that are in the book, um, did this, this nice little sketch that just shows how parking begins to eat up at, uh, you know, uh, basically your typical uh, Main Street lot as more parking is, is required per square foot. And, and you can really watch the progression here from on the upper left, the typical, um, you know, U.S. Main Street circa 1920, um, to what we uh, wind up with in, in many of our communities today. And I think, I hope one of the points of the book is not to say that what's on the upper left is better and you should like it because X and Y, but rather to say, um, just to illustrate to people the trade-offs that we've made by requiring all this parking. And I think uh, in many communities, people actually do have a preference for what's on the upper left and they've wound up with what's on the lower right um, simply because they're not quite aware of, of the way that their priorities intersect. And in this case, uh, the obligation to provide parking turns out to be one of the prim primary determinants of the urban form. Next. Yeah, and this is a concept I, I heard about from actually a new urbanist named Peyton Chung, who uh, told me about the valley of the high parking requirements, which was the idea that um, Parking requirements work pretty well at at low densities um, because it's pretty easy to provide the parking that's required uh, right there on the on on the surface without uh, digging down or building up, which is very expensive. Uh, on the right of the uh, the valley, you see also places where uh, land values are high and densities are high, and those places also actually manage to um, conform to parking requirements. And that's because land values are high enough that developers can afford to build garages, and it makes sense. It pencils out um, to maybe you know put your building on top of a four or five story garage, a sort of parking podium um, in the back, and then in the front. Uh, the type of building that is sometimes known as a Texas donut, where the uh, residential use wraps around an interior parking garage. This stuff only works um, where uh, land is expensive enough that it that it makes sense to to build that type of structured parking. Um, and then in the middle, uh, of course, we wind up with the famous uh, missing middle. Um, and, and in this case, parking requirements is an important factor in that because um, if you don't have those super high land values uh, and you don't want to build sprawl, um, you find yourself in the middle of that valley where it's really hard to make anything work, um, given the amount of parking that is required by law. So next. Uh, 
And all of this adds up to a situation in which uh, you know, I think perhaps even more important than the the actual codes that I was showing you earlier, which are in place in most American communities, um, we have this situation in which parking is actually people's primary concern when they think about uh, residential density, when they think about new neighbors, when they think about society. And they think about new neighbors as coming in parking-sized packages. And that, in turn, serves as a motivating um uh, you know, a reason to to reject change and to to stop pe new people from moving into your neighborhood at a time when housing affordability is is really perhaps our primary challenge um, in our cities. And uh, the fact that parking remains this enormous obstacle is is stopping us from from doing better things. And 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 I get it, right? I mean, I think if you're competing for street parking it, and you're concerned that the new neighbors are going to take your street parking. Um, then, then you will see uh, you will see them as a threat to to street parking before you see them as potentially um, future friends, uh, future future neighbors, um, you know, future classmates, etc. Um, so, so this is the situation in which we find ourselves, and I think this is um, just should provide that much more incentive to try and figure it out, to try and find some sort of compromise between requiring so much parking that we have basically outlawed uh, places that look like this. Um, and on the other hand, uh, just uh, throwing up our hands and uh, deciding that we're not going to think about parking at all, in which case we might end up with situations where neighbors um, take things into their own hands and just say, well, we're not going to allow anybody to, to live near us ever again. Uh, next. So um, as I worked on the course of this book, I began to think about all the things that become possible when we're able to take parking uh, down a rung on our hierarchy of urban needs. This is a photo from Chicago, uh, from the Little Italy neighborhood, and it just shows, um, you know, this is not like some famous design as far as I know. I just happened to stop in and say, wow, this street has become a really lively and pleasant place. And you'll notice that one of the things that distinguishes this part of the block is that um, there is no parking there. And, uh, and that, that, that creates a sort of really open green space that, you know, it is a street and a car could drive down there, but it does sort of um, take on the air of a public space in the sense that a, that a more, um, you know, in the way that streets once did in, in most American cities. And, and I think one of the um, takeaways, again, is, is not that um, we should get rid of parking because parking is bad, but that parking is what is standing in the way of um, of establishing these kinds of public spaces, which again, um, just like that building we were looking at before, um, are actually uh, most Americans' idea of of what looks good and what they'd like to see in their neighborhood. Next, of course, parking is also a major impediment at redesigning streets to make it possible not to drive. Um, one of the primary uh, objections I come across when I talk about this book is people say, well, um, it's well and good you want to uh, get rid of parking, but in my neighborhood, there really isn't enough parking. And so it's not going to work for us because people are dependent on their cars to do X and Y. Um, and I think there are many neighborhoods in which people claim there is a parking shortage and there actually is not one, um, which any parking consultant will tell you. They go to city after city where um, they hear there's not enough parking. And in fact, there is, it's just two blocks away, or it's inside a garage or something like that. Um, but the other thing, uh, which is important, is that uh, when we think about making it possible for people to get around ways besides driving, parking is very much an impediment uh, to making that happen. And this is a kind of idealized street design. Um, but one thing you can notice here is that the curb lane uh, has been pushed into the street and is being used by kind of a bus rapid transit situation. And that is um, one of the ways that we can make transit more efficient and more attractive for people and encourage them not to drive. But it is impossible um, in most places to create this type of system because uh, you often have to take a lane of parked cars away. This is also, of course, true um, for bike lanes, um, like real protected bike lanes that make people feel safe when they're riding with their kids, for example. Uh, and those uh, those really aren't possible either 
unless you're willing, maybe not to get rid of a whole line of parked cars, but to move them. Daylighting intersections is another example of this. I mean, there's so many changes to our streets that simply cannot be accomplished um, because uh, there is so much resistance to taking away parked cars. And this is not only in cities where people really are uh, mostly relying on their cars to get to work, but also in a place like New York City, where fewer than half of households own cars, even there. Um, there's been tremendous resistance even to making bus riders uh, commutes a little bit faster by giving them their own lanes. The average speed of a New York City bus is something like seven miles an hour. Um, and you begin to understand, well, uh, at that at that pace, um, no wonder people drive, right? And um, you can't unlock this virtuous cycle of, uh, of of people, you know, ditching their cars for other modes, um, unless you begin to take some of that space away from parked cars. Next. Oh, and then of course there's there's public space and and civic life, and I think um, this is an old idea, but if you uh, decide that you're going to consign the street um, to be exclusively for the storage of, of cars um, and also for their movement, but often um, it's the storage that really uh, gets people uh, really hung up. Um, you foreclose all kinds of other uses and it can be hard to even imagine what might be possible until you have a day like this, where uh, this is this is Brooklyn and you can see the block is, is closed for a block party. And I mean, it just, it just looks and in fact was uh, very idyllic. And, uh, and a really lovely occasion for neighbors to get together and get to know each other and grill and kids playing in the street. And it's just a, the whole thing is completely transformed in a way that I think is quite difficult to imagine um, if you haven't seen it right in front of your eyes. Uh, and again, this is the kind of change that, that is impossible um, when you've consigned so much of the urban real estate to be used for, for storing cars. Next. Of course, we had a very prominent example of this epiphany during the pandemic when uh, spaces in front of restaurants were um, converted into uh, space to eat. And, um, and this was especially funny because prior to this, restaurants and small businesses generally had often been some of the, the most, the loudest agitators for more parking, for required parking, um, for free parking. And when they began to see that, in fact, this real estate could be put to some other use, um, they decided well, you know what, uh, maybe it would be better as something else. And, and suddenly those, um, those concerns about parking uh, just simply vanished. And I think there has obviously been a lot of uh, retrenchment on this issue uh, since the pandemic. But I think the thing that we can take away from this is that um, lots and lots of people had this epiphany that maybe some of you have had, that the space that we currently allocate to cars on the curb um, does not need to be used that way. And it could, in fact, be used for something else. Next. Uh, and then finally, um, you have the what's happening in uh, some cities where there has been this realization. This is a photo from Paris where they begun they begun closing uh, the streets outside of schools to cars. And this is, uh, I think, actually a, a policy idea that could pretty easily be adapted to U.S. cities, even in places where people mostly drive their kids to school. You could just move the drop off point a little bit further away. And what you see here is that the street obviously is pedestrianized, um, but not only that, it, it takes on this kind of, um, it becomes a kind of um, an easy civic space to create because it functions as a bridge between the school and the neighborhood. And in that sense, it not only creates a, a space for the kids to hang out after school, um, but soon pretty quickly also becomes a place where uh, adults like to walk and um, they can sit at a cafe where their, while their kids play soccer in the street or, or something like that. And um, this is, I think, a baby step towards rethinking our relationship with, with cars. But uh, every time I go to one of these, I just think, well, that that's just, it's just so nice. Um, and, and, and perhaps the thing that you can't see in this photo um, or understand until you're there is just how quiet it is and how one of people's biggest complaints about city life, um, that it's noisy, is really a complaint about cars. And that when you get rid of cars, um, you, you, you suddenly find yourself in, in the space that's, that's super, super quiet. And again, um, this is a street that's actually not closed to traffic entirely. All you have to do is um, 
uh, open that gate with a little peg, um, and, and you can and you can drive and make your delivery or drop off your package or, or pick something up or, or whatever it is. Uh, but the important thing about this the street is that it is no longer used for parking cars. And in in that sense, you really see how that the absence of the parked cars um, liberates people to feel like it's their own. And and there is some sort of law that uh, that I've observed here, which is that if you uh, create a pedestrian street, people will walk right down the middle of it instead of uh, along the side on the sidewalks. Um, and that, I think, is it for my presentation. And now we're going to have a discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Henry. That was really great. I also had the pleasure of reading your book before we got on this webinar. I really enjoyed it. And I had some questions for you. Um, just through reading your book. Um, kind of one of the first ones, and I think I saw it in the chat as well, is that cities and towns nationwide are starting to actually remove parking minimums. And through the course of your research in your book, what did you find were the inflection points for parking reforms in major cities? over the past decade? And kind of were there geographic trends, political will, or other things that made this happen nationwide? Uh, well, with respect to geography, I have to say it is um, very much a nationwide phenomenon. If you look at the Parking Reform Network's map of places that have begun to um, revise their policies towards this, you will see that it is all across the country. Now, many of those places are small towns that have done away with parking requirements just on their main streets, which I think is a it's a nice start and enables um, especially the revitalization of historic buildings, which I mean, there's nothing worse than a place that has uh, parking requirements so strict that people are tearing down historic buildings um, just to provide the requisite parking. And um, and so the, the downtown restrictions being lifted is, is a big part of that. Um, more broadly, I think you're seeing it in two types of places, small towns, and big cities. The places you're not seeing it yet are suburbs. And that's really where, unfortunately, most of the work needs to come because um, those are the places where uh, I expect we would like to see most housing growth um, going forward uh, because in many cities, the suburbs have been have hardly changed their population profile in, in many years. And they're stuck with this very uh, restrictive single use um, uh, land use paradigm. And I think um, the suburbs are changing, and I think many people would would like to begin to see that stuff change. And it's not going to change until there's a new approach um, to parking. Uh, as far as inflection points are concerned, I think there's there's two uh, things that motivate people who are interested in reform on this issue. And one is housing affordability. And so, in places where housing is super expensive, um, the uh, the choice that we make with every project about whether to provide space parking or whether to provide that space for housing, that choice becomes um, more and more conspicuous uh, in the fact that we have decided to choose parking over housing. And I think that's what you've seen in certainly on the West Coast, where these reforms have have, have really taken off. And you've got statewide changes that have happened in, in California and Oregon and Washington. And, um, and so that, I think, is a major part of it. And the other one, of course, is climate, because transportation is our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so if we want to, um, to, to, to tamp that down and, and enable people to have other ways um, to get around, uh, then phasing out some of these, just, I would just say more broadly, reassessing our thinking about parking is important. And that's for several reasons, not only um, because as I mentioned before, parking serves as a, an actual obstacle to creating other ways for people to get around, um, but also just because parking encourages car ownership. And so the more parking you have, the more people will drive. And that is just, uh, that's that's kind of the opposite of, of what people thought at mid-century when they were thinking about that parking size gorilla. They thought more parking will reduce traffic because people will get off the street and into the parking lot. And in fact, what we found in 70 years of experimenting with this is that that is mostly not the case. Very cool. Yes, we are definitely seeing that happen um, in our cities and small towns for sure. Um, speaking kind of on those same lines, here at CNU, one of our things we work on is our project for code reform. 
And this identifies barriers to creating walkable communities by recommending incremental code reforms. Um, and one common code reform we recommend is adjusting parking requirements. Can you talk a little bit more, and you mentioned this in your presentation with the Valley of High Parking, um, can you talk a little bit more about the role of parking requirements in addressing new urbanist principles like missing middle housing? Yeah, I was just looking today at a great diagram from um, Opticos, which is the firm that coined the expression missing middle housing, I believe, um, showing how uh, parking requirements reduce the uh, available density uh, for a given plot of land. Um, and, and basically the conclusion of this was that even uh, if you're providing uh, one space uh, per unit, um, which is low by the standards of, of many suburbs, certainly, um, you are, uh, you're effectively cutting residential density in half when you require all this parking on site, you know, given a, an existing building envelope. Obviously, you could build a four-story building atop a two-story garage, but that has um, bad effects on the, the urban environment as, as well. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is that parking has it serves as a huge impediment to building these types of designs, um, both because it's very expensive, and if you're building a relatively small project, um, those costs can serve as um, those, those costs look very large, and uh, it, it you know and 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 I think uh, I heard once a developer say parking is is sort of like eggs you can't buy just one like parking spaces come in trays and so um, if your parcel only has room for say four parking spaces um, and the code says you need one space uh, per unit. Um, then you are going to build four units. And if you'd like to build five units instead, um, and that triggers a requirement for another parking space, well, then you're really in trouble because you're gonna have to build a ramp or you're gonna have to go underground. You're gonna have, have to find some other solution. And, um, and, and that it sort of, that in, on its own shapes the design of projects, that there's this sort of marginal cutoff point at which you trigger another tray of parking um, and, and suddenly that's that's no longer possible. And so the other and the, so the other thing besides the cost, obviously, um, is the geometry. Um, and that's a big part of it too, right? Like uh, you simply do need to dedicate your ground floor to parking in order to provide enough parking to um, have a certain amount of missing middle housing in, in a relatively dense neighborhood. In some places, you might be able to put that parking behind. Uh, but again, uh, if you're building it, you know, uh, let's say like north side of Chicago kind of densities, which to me is like the missing middle paradigm, right? Like there's neighborhoods that have on one block, everything from a single family home to a six story courtyard apartment. And um, and those types of buildings get really difficult to build um, if you're four store require that much parking. And then obviously, um, that is especially true of commercial structures uh, because their parking requirements tend to be even higher. And if you have a commercial area where um, you have parking in front of every building, you, you've just created a space that, that no one's really going to want to walk around. That totally makes sense. Yeah, missing middle is a very big topic right now as we were talking about affordability. Um, another kind of question I had from reading your book was about kind of the money involved with parking and how punishing people for parking violations can be a pretty lucrative business for a town. How does the role of financing and parking violations impact a government's willingness to change parking uh, practices? That's a great question. One thing I learned when I was working on this book is that um, many cities make more money from parking violations than they make from meters and garages and even garage taxes put together. Um, and that's really bad, right? Like uh, New York City, for example, makes twice as much from parking meter, parking fees, parking violations as they do from meters and garage taxes. And it's a similar pattern in most cities. And to me, that shows two things. Number one, the parking system is not very well designed if people are um, in violation that often. Uh, and obviously enforcement is really spotty. Most of the time you park illegally, you, you don't get ticketed. Um, and, and so for this reason, I think, you know, to some extent cities do have high parking fines um, because 
they want to disincentivize illegal parking. And because enforcement is spotty, um, the fines have to be high. And it's really, it's a terrible system because it both um, makes people feel really, really mad about parking enforcement because they feel like the, the fine for illegal parking is uh, way out of proportion to the offense. And most of the time, it's hard to argue with that. Um, and also, uh, it traps people in cycles of fines and debt uh, that can lead to more serious consequences in a way that shouldn't be on anyone's agenda for creating a, a fair and equitable city. So the question is, how do we get around this? How do we create a system um, where people are both incentivized to follow the rules um, and also, uh, the rules aren't uh, so punitive as to as to really uh, really punish people here. And I think there's a few steps to this. Number one is that the city needs to design a system um, that's focused on creating space for people to park and maximizing the ease of parking, um, rather than thinking purely about how much money we can make. Because at first glance, I think those of you who are familiar with the teachings of Don Shoup will think, well. The incentive for cities to make money from parking is good because they will charge market prices for parking spaces. But actually, because cities make more money from fines than from fees, they're not really concerned with charging the proper price for meters and freeing up spaces on busy main streets. They're, they, they have an incentive for people to park illegally, um, even if illegal parking comes with uh, many other negative consequences for the street, such as creating traffic congestion and all that. So um, the first thing I think is for cities to really think about how they're designing these systems and what is their goal in designing these systems. And it shouldn't be maximizing revenue. Um, but then the second part of it is they have to do a better job of parking enforcement because again, the reason the fines are so high is for them to have a deterrent effect. Most cities in Europe now use um, automated parking enforcement, license plate reading. They have a car go around with a sort of camera on the top um, that just scans all the license plates and checks them against the, you know, uh, the digital uh, data and sees who has paid for a parking space and who's out of compliance and all that. And they issue the tickets in the mail. And um, that hasn't been adopted in American cities, I think, because there would be so many parking tickets that people would revolt and they would destroy the vehicles and uh, they'd have to park them in some secret garage uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere so that nobody knew where they were. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? Like if parking enforcement were more efficient and more dependable, and it was also easier to park legally, then you can imagine a situation in which parking fines were reduced to amount to something like, you know, $20 in a place where a meter, uh, a meter was a dollar an hour, something like that, right? And, and then I think you begin to, to come to a place where people um, could begin to feel more positively about this. Um, and, and, and obviously, uh, and, and obviously it helps too that, that the money goes towards something in the neighborhood that people can appreciate. And that's that's another lesson of Donald Shoup's, which is um, people don't like to feel like the money they're paying for parking uh, is going into a black hole of, of the city budget or even worse to some private company. Um, and if you can show them that that money is paying for improvements that they use that make the neighborhood more pleasant, whether it's transit passes or bike share or um, street trees or park benches, all that stuff um, that makes people feel much better about paying for parking. They feel like they're making a, a positive contribution. Very cool. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's definitely a multi-pronged approach. Um, and speaking of Donald Shoup, as you featured him in your book as well, um, can you share an insight or an anecdote from Don Shoup that you found particularly interesting or enlightening? Oh, where to start? I mean, the high cost <laughs> of parking is, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous book. It's a great scholarly achievement and it's also funny and um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like a page turner, but like it's pretty fun if you're into parking policy. Um, and 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 Don is Don is also really funny. And I think the thing that stands out, maybe, you know, it, it would be impossible to pick just just one thing from from the high cost of free parking because Don sort of founded this field and 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 blew it wide open. But um, but the one thing I'll say about Don is that he is um, extremely uh, funny and generous with his time. And I think anybody who has gotten into parking reform in the last couple of decades has crossed paths crossed paths with him uh, on a few occasions. And I think one of the reasons that this um, 
one of the reasons that this has taken off as a place where people are pushing and trying to figure out better ways of, of organizing it is not just because it takes up so much land and there's this sense that we could be doing it better, um, but also because Don, who uh, has done all this research on this topic and for a while was really the only person who had, um, is super, super generous with his time and really, really eager uh, to work with people who are making changes in this space. That's wonderful. Um, my final question before we go to the audience Q&A is as more places remove parking mandates and minimums, where do we go from here? Uh, what can we learn from other countries that have kind of pushed back against the American export of suburbia? And kind of what have you seen? Where do you think we're headed next? Well, I think the most important thing for cities that are working on these reforms is to couple those reforms with changes to streets policy, to transportation policy, because it is not going to be effective to tell people that they can choose to live in a building that hasn't been provided with parking spaces um, if you're not going to start to encourage people to get around in other ways. And that that should be the easiest part of this, because in most American cities, the streets are so wide, there's so much space, um, and the improvements that are needed um, to make it uh, fast, easy, safe to walk, bike, ride transit, et cetera, all that stuff is really low-hanging fruit. We know how to do it. Um, it's just that there hasn't been a lot of political will to do it. And so I hope that that's the next thing that comes out of this uh, discussion is that once we realize that um, building ha housing without parking is good and is eventually going to result in um, a lower amount of traffic associated with every new resident and lower rate of car ownership associated with every new resident. Uh, but we also need to think about reforming the policies um, on our streets to make it safe to get around without driving. Um, and then after that, I think the other thing is that in places that really do um, suffer from a parking shortage, we need to begin to think more seriously about how to regulate street parking. And that's big political third rail. I did an interview with um, Jake Bloomgard from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Philadelphia is a city that in many places has a legitimate um, parking shortage in the sense that there is not available parking in the places where, where people need to park on their block often. Um, and uh, Philadelphia has, it's also a city with um, that doesn't have as strong of, a, I think, a NIMBY culture as, as some other American cities. And so they've begun to approve a lot of new development, some of which has no parking included, which is great for affordability and great ultimately for encouraging people not to drive. But um, but when those residents start to park their cars on the street, obviously you, you get conflict. And so um, there's various options being explored uh, for how to um, navigate this challenge and how to improve more parking without, um, more housing without parking, um, without further contributing to a sense that uh, there's going to be like conflict between neighbors. Um, but it's it's definitely a thorny question because some of the solutions that I've seen proposed involve basically implying that the newer residents in the neighborhood shouldn't have the same rights as the people who've been there for years. Like they shouldn't have the same right to park in the public right of way. Um, or uh, perhaps the most extreme example of this is in Phoenix at cul-de-sac, which is this um, very new urbanisty new development um, in in Tempe. And uh, last I checked, they were saying that in order to get uh, out of their um, obligation to provide parking with the city of Tempe, they promised that future lessees would sign in their leases that they would not own a car and park it on the street. And to me, like, that is that's not a good solution. We don't really want new neighbors to come into the neighborhood under a different status uh, than people who have been living there for a long time just because they got to the public street parking first. That's very cool. Yeah, we also featured cul-de-sac in one of our previous on the park benches. So as a plug, if you want to know more, you can check us out and see our recordings of previous webinars. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my questions, Henry. Uh, that was really great for me. Um, hopefully you all learned a lot. And now I'm going to turn it over to the audience Q&A. So I'm just taking a look at some of the questions here. And I'm going to combine a couple that kind of have to do with the different types of will that are required to remove parking. 
So we have questions from Neville and Healy that are basically, how do we show local retailers that it is in their long-term interest to support uh, getting rid of parking along curbs and remove parking? And in the same way, uh, politicians and financial institutions, how do we change parking minimums in that same way, in that same basis? Right. Well, I think there's a couple of things going on. I mean, one of them is that uh, local local retailers, um, there's been so many studies on this that show that people who come by bike or on foot really do contribute a lot of money to local establishments. And this goes counter to, I think, like literally decades of thinking about um, shoppers, right? Like, I think there's some famous quote from some store magnet in Buffalo in the urban renewal era saying something like, I would rather have um, I would rather have one person who came in a car than 10 people who came on foot because, of the, you know, cars associated with both with wealth and with also buying a lot of stuff. And I think um, there's a lot of studies since then that prove that actually people who come on foot or on bike are, are just as likely to spend money. And that's especially true, of course, of restaurants, but it's also true of retail um, and especially in an era when everybody can have everything delivered anyway. Um, just because somebody comes in a car is not a sign that that person is going to uh, drop more money on, on, on their purchases. Um, so um, there's lots of studies about this. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think people find it hard to believe until um, the rubber meets the road. And so I think to some extent, if you sit around as a city and try and convince every owner on the block that um, that by getting rid of uh, X uh, number of parking spaces, you're you're going to make business better because you're going to make the street safer and more pleasant. You're going to be stuck there for a long time. And I think the only way to do it is trial and error. And again, take it back to these um, some of these open streets outside the schools that I showed you in Paris. That's been the pattern here. Um, we're on block after block where they've created this. Retailers basically said, yeah, this is good. And in fact, people who, the street traffic is more pronounced on those blocks in part because uh, the sidewalks here are so narrow. And so you actually see that where, where streets are open, people um, prefer those places. And so I think trial and error is really the key. You can show anybody any number of studies and it's going to be um, pretty difficult uh, to convince them in the absence of of, of just doing it uh, to some extent. And then when it comes to politicians, um, I think you can, they are actually more susceptible to looking at studies and data, especially about municipal revenue, housing affordability, development, all that stuff. I mean, um, they're supposed to have all that stuff in, in the back of their mind when they're making decisions. But I think the most important thing for politicians is often um, just to get them out of their cars and to get them to ride a bike, get them to use transit, get them to use these systems that they are in charge of managing. And um, like in California, actually, which when they abolished parking requirements near transit for, um, for most uses, this happened, this has been proposed for years by an um, assembly woman who comes from Glendale, a city near Los Angeles, and uh, she had had her own brush with parking requirements and thought the whole thing was ridiculous, and so she sponsored this reform, but it got held up by a guy um, who didn't like these types of policies, and what changed his mind was during the pandemic, he started riding a bicycle, and he saw the world in a new way, and I think I certainly have had this experience, and maybe many of you have have had this too, but um, politicians just aren't going to get it until they get out of their cars. And that's true for biking, and it's especially for, true for transit. And for transit, you've got, um, sometimes you've got transit boards, uh, like in Chicago, that are made up of people who don't use the system at all. I mean, zero. So how can they be expected to understand how frustrating it is to be in a bus that's stuck because there's a double park delivery van because there's no loading zone on the street or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's that's really just one of the most effective um, things you can do for politicians is just plead with them, you know, just, just come out of here, try it. Very true. Um, you mentioned in your answer uh, some things about data and we have two questions here, one from Tung and one from Terry basically asking, what sort of data do you think is missing from parking research? And in that same vein, is there any specific point at which transit mitigates the need to provide surface or garage parking? Uh, I, I, let me start with the second one. Um, I think reformers should be cautious of making promises 
uh, that transit will lead to less driving. I think because driving often responds to the availability of parking and people will drive to suit exactly how much parking there is. And if one person who used to drive decides they're going to take the bus, then somebody else who didn't used to come downtown at all will decide to drive because it's become that much easier and the parking's become that much more available and so on. So I would instead frame it as um, better transit provision allows us to have more um, urban activity, really, um, without having to um, spend the money to form the urban environment, um, create the env environmental blight, um, and spend, uh, and again, like, uh, that is that is providing all those all those parking spaces. So um, I think that's that's the promise of of, of transit, and and also um, it's just important too with respect to um, building housing without parking. I mean, you again, uh, that's a really great and overdue reform. And one of the reasons that it's overdue is because parking requirements usually overbuilt the parking. So it wasn't just a case of providing the parking for people who needed it. It was it was really a case of, of a lot of waste. And so that's great that we're getting rid of that. But um, at the end of the day, like you can't do that reform and and not at the same time um, uh, provide provide ways for people to get around. So I think that's that, that's really crucial. Um, and then with respect to data, um, the field is still plagued by so little information about so much of this stuff, it, beginning with how many parking spaces there are in a city, in a neighborhood, in the country as a whole. It's just, it's just, uh, it's, there's really no good information. And um, I think that's a place where I would just, would really be great to see people um, focus on that more. Uh, and then, you know, I think the other thing is that we've had so little experimentation with how we provide parking, that there is a lot of research to be done on, um, for example, there's all this new research coming out right now about the effects of these parking reforms, like ones that were undertaken in Buffalo, Minneapolis, and San Francisco, and Hartford, Connecticut, um, five or six years ago. They were some of the earliest cities uh, to get going, uh, allowing housing to be built without parking. And that kind of research is just happening now. So to some extent, we are still uh, flying a little blind in terms of our um, understanding of uh, whether the market is is going to um, cut back on parking if they're no longer uh, these laws in place, and and if so, how much? And then uh, again, following from that, how that affects car ownership, car use, all that stuff. Um, that that is, it's all it's all so new, and um, and it's really important, right? Because I think one of the big cases that reformers make is that. Um, Building less parking won't just mean uh, more attractive architecture, nicer neighborhoods, and better housing affordability, but it will also, in the end, lead to fewer people driving. And so um, it's important that we follow up and find out what's happening to the people who live in those projects. And um, if they decide to own a car, do they park it on the street? Would they um, would they use transit if it came near them? All that stuff. Um, so I think that's really important to figure out. Absolutely. And we have a question here from Terry, which is, Henry, in a perfect world, what would you envision to be the best balance between a desire for free, convenient, and available parking? Um, I think convenient and available <laughs> is, is really the sweet spot. Um, I think one thing we learned, right, like this is Don Shoup's whole thing, free parking isn't really free. Um, it, it, it feels free when you use it, but it's just because somebody else is paying for it. And, uh, that may be because, um, it's paid for by whoever owns that parcel and has to devote half their property to parking. It's certainly paid for, um, in the externalities that are associated with parking and with driving, um, which include obviously traffic congestion, fatalities, um, local particulate pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, all that stuff. Those are all externalities associated with free parking um, that don't get paid for by you when you park there for free. Um, and I think that's that's kind of old news to people who follow this debate closely, but parking is 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 never really free. And so I think convenient and available is really the sweet spot. And I guess the good news is parking is so mismanaged that you don't really need to do that much in a lot of places um, to create a situation in which there is convenient and available parking. And in many cases, uh, 
free and convenient and available, sorry, free and available parking uh, just a little further away. And so you give people the choice, right? And that's possible in most small towns and even in a lot of big city commercial areas um, where you can say, look, you want to park right in front of the restaurant? Yeah, that's going to cost you $2 an hour. But the good news is if you're more price sensitive, look, there's this big residential neighborhood of single family homes like six blocks away. There's all this unused curb space and you can park there and you can walk. And that's a free parking option for you. And I think that that, you know, in an ideal world, you, you do have a little bit of, of something for everyone there. Um, and and, and that, that would really be the, the perfect situation. Very cool. We also have some questions of kind of relating to street parking. One is removing parking minimums. Will it require street parking? And in that same vein, um, what are your thoughts on on street parking from a traffic calming standpoint? And does uh, the traffic calming aspect justify on street parking? Yeah, I mean, there have been places where I think uh, the there's a couple ideas about getting rid of parking minimums and what it means for on street parking. Um, Michael Manville, who did the study of downtown L.A. after they got rid of their parking requirements, thinks that one of the reasons that that worked in downtown L.A., was because downtown LA has no free on-street parking. And that means that, that people who moved into these buildings weren't suddenly all competing for this uh, scarce resource. Instead, um, they were making effective use of these um, office garages, which were often unused at night, uh, precisely when the residents needed them. I I've also heard that in Austin, Texas, where they've begun to experiment with some parking light or parking free buildings, they make sure that the uh, some of the places where that those buildings get built have meters on the street so that there isn't just this problem of um, people who live in those buildings uh, leaving their cars on the street for free. Um, of course, that also those meters on the street also apply to anybody who lives in the neighborhood. And I think that that's a that's a pretty fair situation in which um, the value of the curb is being um, basically uh, channeled in these parking meters, but it's being the, the cost of that is being borne by new residents and old residents alike. And then the third scenario, which I think is the kind of like sort of uh, appeals to the worst in human nature, is to say the people who live in a neighborhood get some sort of grandfather right to, to street parking. And you've lived here for long enough, it belongs to you, you get some sort of tradable permit that new residents aren't eligible for. And that's what's happening in Tempe with cul-de-sac and you could see something like that being affected in a place like Boston in order to encourage residents to ease up on uh, permitting new development. And in fact, they would have an incentive to permit new development because they would know that only they have the right to on-street parking. And that, that right would become more and more valuable as, as more um, neighbors moved in. Wonderful. Yeah, that totally makes sense. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so we have this one from David. There are many different systems for metered on-street parking, including conventional coin meters, smartphone systems, central kiosks, and others. Is there a consensus developing on which one works best? Um, I'm really not an expert in that. Um, I, I, I won't pretend to be able to answer the question. I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Um, I do think that it's, I think there's been some, um, hesitancy about parking meter privatization related to the deal in Chicago that, that has been a, a huge albatross for that city, but I don't think there's any reason that cities should go out of their way to reinvent the wheel in terms of how to pay for parking. There's all these companies that are out there offering reasonable solutions about how it should be done. And I think this is another case in which, again, if you're not maximizing for revenue, you have an opportunity to work with people and make paying for parking much more convenient. For example, making it possible for people to pay remotely. You're sitting in the restaurant, you're long, you're staying longer than you thought you would. You just write in a little, you do something on your phone and suddenly you, you can stay for another hour. And conversely, maybe if you leave early, maybe you shouldn't have to pay for all that parking you bought after that. And that's a system that obviously from the perspective of the city collecting money for the meters, um, they wouldn't like that. But if you're really managing the street in the interest of providing uh, available curb space, 
you really shouldn't be collecting more money from people than you really need. And, and once they've, once they've paid for their parking and they've left that spot, um, maybe you should give them back their money. And that's another way to make people maybe uh, uh, further appreciate the idea that, that paid street parking is not a money grab, but simply a way of managing this precious um, uh, access point between uh, streets and buildings. Oh, and then I was supposed to say, sorry, I was supposed to say something about street parking and protection. And I think that that's, um, that was actually one of the least intuitive things to me when I was starting on this. But uh, John Massengale convinced me that um, street parking is good on busy streets to protect people who are walking from traffic. And I, I buy that. I think we've all been on downtown streets where there's no street parking and where buses run really fast in the curb lane. And it's not a particularly pleasant experience to be on the sidewalk where that's happening. And I think what you see in a lot of um, European cities, like, you know, is the protected bike lane model where the, the bike lane is between the parked cars and the curb. And I don't think any American city should build any other type of bike lane. I mean, that just seems like a total no brainer, um, both for, from the perspective of protect, protecting cyclists and, and also because it's really a very small sacrifice for the people who are parking their cars there. I think the place where you begin to get into trouble um, with the issue of parked cars protecting uh, pedestrians is around intersections, right? Where parked cars really inhibit the ability of approaching drivers to see who's about to cross the street. And there is a well-established practice in street design called daylighting, where you remove the parked cars around the intersection so that people can see uh, as they're approaching the intersection. And um, that's obviously hard to do if, um, if you're super attached to street parking. Very cool. Well, with that, I think we will wrap it up. Thank you so much, Henry, for taking the time to share more about your book, To Pay Paradise, today. Um, for all attendees, a recording of this webinar will be available within 24 hours. And you can keep an eye on your emails for that link. Uh, thank you again, Henry. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone.